Okay, hi everybody. It's great to see uh, all your smiling faces, and there are so many of you, so it's just great. Um, I am uh, about, I'm going to put it in the chat. No, oh, let's see if this works. Oh, I hit the wrong button. I got it. Oh, you got it. No, that's all right. I just put it, thanks, Julie. I just sent it to the chat. Um, today, I, I put a link to Safari that will bring you to two Mishnayot. Um, we're going to, we're going to do something a little different if you've been with me before in this class from other days. Um, and uh, let me give you a little bit of introduction about why. Um, the, part of the, how this class was, is pitched is that it's uh, highlights of the week in Tafyomi. And uh, this week, um, I want us, we're going to focus really on a particular text because in terms when I think of highlights of the Talmud, this week we encounter a story uh, that's uh, just about on everybody's like, you know, top 20, you have to know this story in the Talmud list. Uh, and you, if you're reading with Dabiomi, you've, you've read this recently, but in terms of highlights, this isn't just the highlight of the week. This is a highlight of, you know, the Talmud. And uh, people have been attracted to this story, uh, both uh, students of the Talmud and uh, scholars doing research and it's one that's drawn to and I thought we would look at it. Um, it's a longer text. So I thought it would be my, be, we do it a little more like story time uh, where I could read you the story. I'm going to pause in places with some questions and for you to type in the chat some answers. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but I put the link in the chat because I know that sometimes there are uh, visual learners, uh, not just um, auditory learners. So if you want to follow along, just follow along. All right. Oh, and I, I do have to pause. I usually don't like the individual shout outs, but I, I just saw besides Erica Goldman Brody, who I see every week and wanted to say hi to, I saw in the corner of the screen, you know, my, my teacher and I had to say hi to, so say hi at home. <laughs> All right. Hi, Rabbi Brody. Nice to see you. All right. Sorry for the personal moment. It's like the reunion over Zoom class. Um, all right, over uh, the course of Masechet Rosh Hashanah, and not even Rosh Hashanah, like we've seen a lot of these stories in, in earlier Masechet, we've learned about how uh, the rabbis declared uh, the, a new month based on witness testimony. Right? The Jewish calendar, as you may know, is a lunar calendar. Uh, uh, Jewish months are based on the cycle of the moon. And so that Jewish holidays uh, stay in their right seasons, uh, we have a cycle where there, we add an extra month. Jewish calendar has a leap month instead of a leap, right? When the, in our secular calendar, we have a leap year, but that really means we add a day. Um, the Jewish calendar, there's a, when it's a leap year, we add a whole month and that helps keep the holidays in their season, right? As opposed to uh, uh, the Muslim calendar, which is also a lunar calendar, it is not uh, coordinated with the solar calendar. So a holiday like Ramadan moves throughout the year. and Sometimes Ramadan where you fast during the day for a month happens in the summer when days are long and sometimes in the winter when days are short. But uh, we keep our holidays in their seasons because as you know, like Passover is a spring holiday, et cetera, et cetera. So by uh, having a leap month, we coordinate that lunar calendar with the solar calendar. And the system by which uh, the rabbis decided when a new month would start, as the Talmud lays out, is witnesses who see the moon would come and, and testify in court that the new moon has arrived and the court would declare uh, the new month to have started. And this would fall either on um, the 30th day of the preceding month or what would be the 31st day of the preceding month. And that's because uh, uh, the, the lunar calendar is about 29 and a half days. So depending on you know, when a month ended in the cycle, the moon would show up either on one day or the next. Um, we've also read about um, other Jewish split off sectarian groups who had different ideas about the calendar, who sometimes tried to interrupt the rabbinic system of announcing the new moon, um, which led the rabbis to put in different procedures to help protect their calendar announcements. Um, and we've also read a number of discussions about could we fudge it a little, meaning could the rabbis decide that the new moon should be, uh, you know, on the on the second of the two possible days instead of the first, that even though um, the moon really showed up on the, on the 30th day, could we delay Rosh Chodesh to the 31st day um, to make things easier? Meaning, uh, well, we know this in the diaspora, right? In my house, we call it the dreaded three-day yontif. 
when there's two days of, of Yom Tov and then Shabbat, you have three days in a row of holiday. Um, you know, the rabbis in the Gemara sometimes talk about, well, if we delay Rosh Chodesh by a day, we could move the holidays and then we wouldn't have a run of three straight days in a row. And you know, sometimes for convenience, uh, the rabbis debated, is it okay to change when Rosh Chodesh would fall to make things easier for Jews? Um, all those stories have been in the background, and that leads to uh, two famous Mishnayot that appear as highlights right now, which uh, um, are from uh, the chapter two of Rosh Hashanah, Mishnah eight and nine, which appear in our Dapim for the week, where we get the following story. Um, so I'll say again, I see lots of people have come on. I, I, the link has been reposted in the, the chat if you want to follow along, but I would say uh, sit back, be comfy, and, uh, we're going to do a little, it'll be like story time as I share with you this famous uh, Mishnahic story. I'm going to use my best um, first grade teacher voice to read it. All set? All right. Cookies and milk are okay. And if you're in a comfy chair, you can lean back. And if hearing a story, close your eyes. If it helps you, image it. Either way. All right. Uh, Rabban Gamliel had a diagram of different forms of the moon drawn on a tablet that hung on the wall of his attic. He would show these to people as they came to testify about the new moon, but couldn't adequately describe what they had seen. And he would say to them, did you see a form like this? Or did you see a form like that? This was the way that Rabban Gamliel would help assure that the witnesses had really seen the moon, and it would help him and the court declare Rosh Hashanah. Once there was an incident, an incident in which two witnesses came to testify about the moon. And they said, we saw a waning moon and mooning in a waning, sorry, we saw a waning moon in the morning in the east. And that same day we saw the new moon in the evening in the west. And Rabbi Yochanan Ben Nuri said, These are false witnesses, as it is impossible to see the moon so soon after the last sighting of the waning moon. However, when they arrived at Yavne, Rabban Gamliel accepted them as witnesses without concern. And there was another incident in which two witnesses came and said, we saw a new moon at its anticipated time, that is, on the night of the 30th day of the previous month. However, on the following night, the start of the 31st day, which is, uh, we did not see the new moon. Nevertheless, Rabban Gamliel accepted their testimony and established the new moon on the 30th day. Rabbi Dosa ben Horkinus disagreed and said, these are false witnesses. How can witnesses testify that a woman gave birth on a particular day and that she was still pregnant on the next day? If the moon was already visible in the sky at its anticipated time, how could it not be there the next day? Rabbi Yoshua said to him, I see the logic of your statement, Rabbi Joseph ben Horkinus. The, the new moon must be established a day later. Upon hearing that Rabbi Yoshua had challenged his ruling, Rabban Gamliel sent a message to him. I decree against you that and you must appear before me with your staff and with your money on the day on which Yom Kippur falls, according to your calculation. Uh, sorry, on the day on which Yom Kippur falls, <coughs> excuse me, on your, according to your calculation, because according to my calculation, that will be the 11th day of Tishrei, the day after Yom Kippur. So I want to pause the story here at this moment of conflict and throw out a few questions. We'll see what you have to say in, um, in the chat. Uh, why do you think that uh, Rabban Gamliel might be declaring Rosh Chodesh, even though the witnesses who came before him seem to be testifying that it's not Rosh Chodesh on the day that he claimed it would be? Do you have thoughts about that? What's motivating Rabban Gamliel to do what he did and accept faulty testimony to make it Rosh Chodesh. Chat away. Uh, Janine says he didn't want anyone to question his authority. And Aaron adds, this is a power schedule, a power struggle, sorry. Who Phyllis wants to cause him, Rabbi Yoshua, you mean to violate Yom Kippur. When Aaron says, oh, his calculations, 
right? He calculated when the moon would be, and he knew when the new moon was, even though the witnesses had different testimony. And we see a power struggle. Oh, and Mary Jane says, nice, maybe to make the festival fall at a more convenient time. So those are some great answers. Oh, Janine has another question too. Is it known what year this story happened? I love that question. Uh, it's because I would say we can't even be sure that this story happened at all, meaning uh, right, uh, the narrative tales about the rabbis that you know, involve these individual conversations, it's hard to place them historically at all. It's possible something happened that led to the story that got into the literature. But if you know about folk, folk tales and stories, this might just be a story that emerged. Uh, although the Talmud uh, does have a number of stories about tension between Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Yoshua. So uh, this might be a theme that's based in reality. Uh, Rob says, he made a mistake. One to be repeated for sure in the future. He wanted to set a precedent in about how to handle it. So Rob says, Rob, I think, if I understand you right, Rob Angamio made a mistake, but once the mistake was made, he wanted to stick with it and not change how things have been uh, made. Uh, and Len adds that, right, this preserves the integrity of the court, meaning if the court says it's Rosh Chodesh, it's Rosh Chodesh, regardless of what the witnesses say. Nice, lots of nice responses. Um, and, all right, halftime is... Uh, Ooh, Saul says, why were the rabbis so rude to Rabbi Gamaliel? Interesting, right? The interpersonal pieces are here. We'll come back to that question a little bit. All right, thanks for your participation. Uh, here's uh, Halftime is now over. Uh, that's Halftime Break was brought to you by My Jewish Learning. And now we're back for part two of the story. Uh, Rabbi Akiva went and found Rabbi Yoshua distressed that the head of the Sanhedrin was forcing him to desecrate the day that he, Rabbi Yoshua, thought was Yom Kippur. In an attempt to console him, Rabbi Akiva said to Rabbi Yoshua, I can learn from a verse, a verse that everything that Rabbi Gamliel did sanctifying the month is done, meaning valid, as it's stated in the Torah, these are the appointed season of the Lord, sacred convocations, which you shall proclaim in their season. Meaning the verse means that whatever you proclaim the holidays to be, whatever you do to set the calendar, that's when the calendar is. Well, so that God sets up that there are festivals, but people are in charge of picking the day on which they fall. Rabbi Yoshua then came to uh, Rabbi Dosa ben Horkinus, he said to him, if we come to debate and question the rulings of the court of Rabbi Gamliel, we must debate and question the rulings of every court that has stood from the days of Moses until now. As it is stated, then Moses went up and Aaron and Adav and Abihu and 70 elders of Israel. That's from Shemot 24 9, Exodus. But why were the names of the 70 elders not specified? Well, this comes to teach us that every set of three judges stands in a court of, that stands in the court of the Jewish people has the same status as Moses. Since it's not revealed who sat on that court mentioned in the Torah, apparently um, we, uh, it's it's enough that they were official judges in the court. We don't need to know their names. And every court has that same authority as well. When Rabbi Yoshua heard what Rabbi Joseph and Horkanah said, says, he, made, he agreed that they must submit to Rabban Gamliel's decision. And he took his staff and his money in his hand and went to Yavne to Rabban Gamliel on the day on which Yom Kippur for, occurred, according to Rabbi Yoshua's calculation. Upon seeing him, Rabban Gamliel stood up and kissed him on the head. He said to him, come in peace, my teacher and my student. You are my teacher in wisdom, as Rabbi Yoshua was wiser than anyone else in his generation. And you are my student, as you accepted my statement, despite your disagreement. The end. So in your questions uh, at halftime, you anticipated some of uh, the themes of the second half of the story. Uh, especially we see this at the end, right? Some of the, Rabbi Akiva and uh, Rabbi Joseph and Horkinus both come to Rabbi Yoshua to try and make him feel better because he feels kind of stuck. Uh, and say, and they, they say, well, listen, you got to listen to the court. What the court says is what it is, even if you disagree. Some of you hinted at that that might be coming in the text. Uh, and Rabbi Akiva also said that, right, uh, it, it might be that 
the holidays are set based when on when humans set them and not based on like when they when you calculate them to be or whether they should fall or what the witness testimony is we have to follow the court um, but you also hinted at that there's some power struggle going on here a little bit because Rabban Gamliel was a uh, was a uh, while he was in a position of power he was in some ways junior to Rabbi Yoshua in terms of status um, and uh, potentially there's a power struggle uh, between the rabbis at play here. Um, this story uh, has captured the attention of scholars and students of the Talmud for so many reasons. Uh, one, it, it uh, brings to life in narrative form some of the uh, legal issues about how we set the calendar. Um, and uh, both in this space and right in the Daily Dose of Talmud, right, if you've been reading along on Dafyomi, you've learned a lot over the past uh, couple of years about um, the technicalities of the setting of Rosh Chodesh and how that works. Um, this narrative form is a whole different way of learning about it, and it's a way in for students of the Talmud uh, or for our Talmud teachers to bring people into that conversation about what are the issues about setting uh, the calendar. Um, it's also a uh, it's also uh, uh, shows you some of the interplay of the politics of the rabbis. I think the drama of this story, which a lot of you um, noted in, our, in the chat at halftime, shows that uh, you know the rabbinic world, as it's depicted in its own text, uh, isn't always a happy and harmonious place. Uh, we see Rabban Kamli uh, sits in a position of power. Um, uh, act in uh, what some feel is a uh, uh, unethical or a, a way towards his teacher, or you know, asserts his power in a way that hurts his teacher's feelings and forces his teacher to act against his own religious interests for the sake of uh, establishing the power of the court. Um, and while some feel that's justified, there are other voices that say, "Well, this story is not so fair to Rabbi Yoshua," um, and it gives you some of the the. Uh, uh, you know, the human element of the dynamics that are here. Um, and I think some of the question, which oh, you guys are starting to ask in the, in the chat is, um, what do you take away from this story? What do you learn from this about uh, the rabbinic world? What, um, what's your takeaway from these two Mishnayot that uh, tell us this story? Uh, what do you think? Chat away. I invite you into the chat. Oh, nice. Aaron uh, notes, we learned earlier, right, about outside factors that impacted upon how we set the calendar. So here we see that it's not both, uh, it's not just an issue between the rabbinic community and other Jewish and sectarian groups. There were also internal divides. Um, that's true. Uh, we see internal conflict here. People have a role in deciding on movements of the moon, not just God. A few people commented on that, right? And that's what uh, uh, Rabbi Akiva comes to say, right? The verses of the Torah say, we right, put the power of deciding the calendar into the chart. And the holidays are set up. Uh, holidays are set up based on what the court determines. It does give us some decision-making factor. Oh, Saul, I like what you had. Rabban Gamli has a chart. He uses science, astronomy, right? He might say, right, and some people read this story to justify that Rabban Gamli accepted the testimony of witnesses because he wasn't trying to move uh, Rosh, uh, Rosh Chodesh off of the day on which he fell but he was trying to put Rosh Chodesh on the day in which it belonged. He just didn't have proper testimony, so he accepted witnesses to move things forward, meaning he circumvented the, uh, he circumvented the testimony process to get the calendar right, uh, whereas other people might have been saying, no, right, we have to rely on witnesses as opposed to science, and some people say Rabban Gamil's motivation here is to get it right because the witnesses don't always get it right. Right on a cloudy day, um, thick clouds, right, witnesses might not see uh, the moon at all. So you can miss Rosh Chodesh because you miss the moon because the 
sky doesn't cooperate. Ooh, our relationship from the chat, our relationship with celestial bodies is continuing mystery. It's also important, right? We're, that's interesting, right? I think about that a lot. I've had, uh, as we think about the sky, like we're, um, uh, someone said to me once, uh, right, uh, uh, Johnny Carson uh, killed astro you know, popular astronomy, not intentionally, but uh, right, we stayed up late to watch The Tonight Show, right? It wasn't just Johnny Carson, but right? As we stayed up late to, re late to watch Johnny Carson, uh, you know, we stopped staring at the sky <laughs> um, and we're less attached to celestial bodies and the mysteries of them and the constellations because, uh, you know, we have late evening entertainment, which also has its value. Uh, but in the rabbi's world, right, the nighttime sky uh, was much more of a fixture. And without the interference of human produced light and electricity, we could see it more. Um, and there's a way in which the life of the rabbis that's depicted in the story and the life of people directed in the story doesn't reflect our own reality. We don't see it or feel it as much uh, as they did because the way in which the world is different. Buchan talks about the Gemara states the rabbis could tell the witnesses to lie to claim the new moon did or did not appear, right? Some of the sugyot that we've looked at here in Rosh Hashanah is about can you pressure witnesses to adjust their testimony? My read of it, Ken, was not that it was about lying, although you did put it in quotes, but it is that um, the judges can push harder or softer on the witnesses to impact whether or not their testimony is acceptable so that Rosh Chodesh appears when the court wants it to. And that plays out some of the tension here between, um, uh, right, who sets Rosh Chodesh? Is it the celestial bodies? Is it the calculations of humans? Is it the witnesses? Is it the court? And what factors make that happen? Uh, there we go. Now, there are some of those options. Uh, Oh, I do want to see some comments about this. The link I gave you in Safaria was to the Mishnah, uh, not to the Gemara. Uh, so in Safaria has both the Mishnah, which appears in the Talmud. Uh, I thought that link would be easier for people to follow if you're following the story. Apologies to those who said uh, um, that it was confusing to them. Uh, all right, we have a few minutes before we're done. Uh, I want to open up. I really appreciate that. I hope you're following the rich conversation that's happening in the chat. Um, would love to see if anybody has follow-up questions or things you want to direct the conversation for our last few minutes today. You can raise your hand with the Zoom button. You can put a question in the chat. All right, maybe not, that's all right. Um, I would say uh, this week is a real rich week of uh, the Talmud, although I hear my teachers in the back room saying every week is a rich week because every week of Talmud is so rich. Uh, but uh, there's uh, a, a lot of uh, interesting, compelling uh, sugyot. I find in the part of Masechet Rosh Hashanah that we're in, um, we get a Mishnah and a short stretch of Gemara and then a new Mishnah. So from now to the end of the Masechet, there are shorter Gemara discussions about more varied topics. Um, sometimes, uh, for me anyway, it keeps my, catches my interest more than when there's a Mishnah and then like a 12-page conversation about it. Um, some people like those. Sometimes I like those too. Uh, and uh, uh, my choice today to focus on this story really, as I said at the beginning, was drawn towards uh, the highlights portion of uh, what we try to do with this space in that, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you were to ask, and I've been involved in groups where we did, if you were to ask you know, teachers and students of the Talmud, what are the top 20 things you should know about the Talmud it, to be oriented to the Talmud? Uh, uh, almost universally, this is one of those stories that's pointed to it. And it was, uh, because of that, it was, uh, uh, too good an opportunity for me to pass up, and uh, I pushed aside all the rest of the week's material for this, but thought it would be nice to hear a story. Uh, 
and hope that uh, 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 the story capt you know captivated your interest and uh, uh, also uh, uh, wanted to try out a different format in terms of uh, the story time format as opposed to uh, let's look at a series of texts. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you did and you didn't get milk and cookies, you could still head that way. Anyway. Uh, oh, Carol's got a hand up. Carol? Um, thank you, Rabbi. Um, I like the news. Uh, Carol, your audio, Hello? Is, yeah, I, your audio was coming in and out a little bit. Would you try again? Okay. Um, I like the format you used today. And I have a question in addition to the um, rabbinic authority competition and the different factions within the Jewish community. Might Rabbi Gamliel also be giving a nod to living in the secular world where calendar is even more important for getting business done and meetings and such um, as well. Um, and also a nod to science, which I think rabbis were fascinated with then as now. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thanks, Carol. I, uh, your audio was a little in and out. So uh, as best as I could hear, you were asking about, we think today about where we have, uh, where we're tied to calendars in different ways and where we live on a, you know, on a secular or non-Jewish calendar. How would, what's the interplay between the two? Um, I think, unfortunately, I lost like the, the heart of your question to the sketchy audio. Uh, so I have a partial response, uh, but I don't know that it will be an actual response because I think of the question fully. But uh, I do, uh, I think it, this is a personal piece. I think, I, you know, I wonder to the degree, I have this debate in my family as um, uh, I like to celebrate my birthday on the Jewish calendar and not on the, the general calendar as a way of trying to think about how do I, how do I bring the Jewish calendar into you know, the life that I'm living? And when I'm in places where I hang out, like Jewish day schools or Camp Ramah, I try to think about how do we highlight the Jewish calendar and not the secular calendar to tie that so we live the rhythms of the Jewish calendar. I know in Israel that's easier to do because uh, uh, there's a way in which the Jewish calendar is in the public society a little more. Um, I think the themes that we see in Rosh Hashanah speak to the themes that were in your question, if I heard you right about how do we play with the different calendars and the worlds that we live in and make them our own and have them guide our lives. So that's an inadequate answer to a partially understood question, which uh, due to audio. Um, anyways, um, we've reached 10 o'clock, everybody, and I really thank you for coming. I'm always impressed with the, the number of screens of your faces that fill up in Zoom. Um, I hope uh, you enjoyed the story this week. and. Uh, Stay tuned. Julie might tell you about the next few weeks in, in passing, but uh, there's good people facilitating ahead and lots of more good Gemara as we move deeper towards the end of uh, Seder Zraim, uh, sorry, Seder Moed, and uh, all the, the texts about the Jewish holidays, calendar, and Jewish living according to the season.